Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and I'm uh, delighted to uh, be part of this panel on uh, data and AI uh, in the sort of new ecology uh, that we're, we're sort of envisioning and part of this uh, whole um, uh, meeting today. And I'm uh, really delighted and honored to be on stage with, with these three guys who I'm going to introduce in a second. But for those of you uh, that haven't met me yet, my name is Jeff Hancock. Um, I'm a psychologist uh, that uh, works on um, social media. And so I founded and direct the Stanford Social Media Lab here, and I'm a professor in the Department of Communication. And I think one thing that I was really excited about for doing this panel is the, the sort of breadths of, of backgrounds here. So you're going to have a behavioral psychologist, uh, somebody that's done really important um, open source software work. Uh, we've got Dazzo Su on law and Sandy, who's uh, a really great uh, computational scientist. So you just have this really amazing breadth. So that's me. I'm Jeff, and I'll be moderating today. Uh, right over here, we have Dazo. Um, Dazo Greenwood has been a lecturer and research scientist at MIT Media Lab, um, kind of doing research and um, you know working with Sandy for a dozen years now. You were saying that's right. Which is pretty amazing, and runs MIT the yeah the Laud at at MIT.edu. So I was browsing through that, and just an amazing resource for uh, everything we're going to be talking about today. Uh, next to him is Sean McDonald. Sean is uh, here at Stanford with me, uh, and he's a fellow at the Digital C uh, Civil Society Lab at Stanford PAX. Um, he thinks a lot about uh, civic trust and public interest in, around digital governance. And he founded uh, as a CEO for Frontline SMS, which uh, as somebody that studies messaging, I was really fascinated by this open source um, platform for, for, for messaging, and has been doing that for a long time before the whole uh, EDE thing happened. Um, and um, really glad to have you here with us. And uh, over on uh, my left, your right, is uh, Sandy Petland. Uh, Sandy is the Toshiba Professor of Media Arts and Sciences, and he uh, directs MIT's Connection Science. Um, and he uh, previously helped create and direct the MIT Media Lab, which is you know one of the pioneers in this whole field. And, and of all the many things that uh, Sandy's done, I, I didn't realize you co-led co the World Economic Forum discussion in Davos that led to the EU privacy regulation GDPR. So. I'll Great highlight educational that. experience. That was very useful for me to learn. So thank you uh, for being here with me. Um, as I mentioned, uh, I'm a behavioral psychologist, and so I'm actually going to be really selfish for part of this uh, panel, and I, I hope all of you um, uh, are willing to be selfish as well. I'm interested in trust. Um, typically, we think a lot. Of, I think a lot about how people uh, think about trust and then behave, either trusting or not trusting. And uh, the, all three of these folks think about trust in really uh, different ways, and so I'm just excited to learn from them. Um, but I'm going to uh, start out by thinking about one of the really key ways that we um, use trust in society, and that is by licensing professionals. So having a lawyer, uh, to having a dentist, to having a doctor, there's all these things that are um, sort of licensed, and we can use that to trust. And Daz, I'm going to start with you by asking, you know, what can we expect about these sort of roles around licensed professionals in a future where, for example, AI could take over some of these tasks? Mm, what a great question. Um, so, uh, you know, I think this is going to show up in a lot of different ways. Uh, a couple of the major ones that come right to mind and that are already starting to happen are uh, relate to what happens when the capability of providing legal advice or uh, financial advice can be um, accomplished as, as well or better by a technology system, an AI system, let's say. And that's already beginning in certain narrow domains to be provably correct. Um, and so one thing is uh, in the UK, there's a new policy that's been proposed, and it was circulated about a month ago. Um, and their approach that they're signaling is one to really embrace this, but in a I'd say in a, in a constrained and careful domain specific way. So they want to have the regulatory agencies provide like waivers and exceptions and um, permission basically for um, non-traditional providers of professional services like startups or uh, maybe parts of large, uh, large existing firms to, to um, make these available to citizens and to businesses. But um, in a narrowly constrained domain, um, and in a way where there's always a human accountable, mm -hmm. well, they say a human or a legal entity, which I'll come back to in a moment, and 
and uh, in, in sort of a way where they'll keep a close eye on it. So it's somewhat, I could say, like uh, limited defined experimentation. One of the implications I think is that it's gonna be, another thing that's gonna be really important is we have certain expectations of professionals today. Um, it's number one, that they're human. <laughs> um, and one of the implications of that is they're capable you know, through our cognition of understanding and applying rules like fiduciary duties of care and loyalty. And these duties adhere to lawyers um, and to financial advisors in some circumstances. And they're one of our sort of compensating measures to um, protect people who are, who are not expert and who are relying possibly to their detriment on this critical type of advice um, and to prevent the, some of the issues that happen when, when the people aren't constrained by these rules. How, how does an AI understand and correctly apply a duty of care and loyalty? There's a lot of judgment there. So we're starting a, a, a bit of a research project um, at my group in the media lab at law.mit.edu to start to create sort of a test harness to look at GPT-3 mm -hmm. and um, some hugging face models and some other things, and basically um, feeding it fiduciary duties exams from um, MPRE for lawyers and similar ones for financial advisors, scoring it to see how it does. There's a gap. <laughs> um, and the real interesting question is what will we do when it starts acing these exams? Mm -hmm. And what does that mean? Um, does it mean that they'll behave this way in practice? Mm -hmm. or are they just performing something? Right. And, and, and the other thing about having a human accountable to these types of duties is that um, they can be held accountable, that you could disbar them, you could fine them, mm -hmm. go to jail. Mm -hmm. what, are the, right. <laughs> what are the method, the, the mechanisms of accountability for algorithmic systems? So th those are some of the questions that rise. Um, overall, I, I think this is definitely something where the benefit can significantly outweigh the harms, but I'm a little bit prudent and I feel like an incremental approach that creates the right safeguards is the right way to go, but I'm very interested to see how far we can go. What's an example of a benefit? Because you, you know, the risk obviously is unaccountable performance, but what's an example of a benefit that you see? The main thing is access to justice and access to law. Um, like I have a couple of legal questions right now that are arising from a major bankruptcy, if you know what I mean. <laughs> um, and, um, and I would like to find um, just the right advice on how certain things are going to play out. And you know, finding a lawyer, you right. know, getting the right advice and everything else. And, it, and, and even for smaller things, for small business and most families don't have access to law yeah. almost at all. Right. Um, and so I think making this I mean, we're held accountable to what the law is. You know, ignorance of the law is no excuse. Mm -hmm. Can we access it? I think technology can help even that. Got it. Yeah, Sean. I, I'm, I'm such a nerd for this subject matter specifically. I think, and I, and I think one of the things that's really valuable is to, to pull apart some of the concepts that you're describing. So like a duty of care, for example, yeah. standard, of practice, standard of practice, you can code a duty of care relatively quickly and relatively more effectively, it's in fact, the efficiencies of computational duty of care are much higher. But for duty of loyalty, the inverse is true. And you have huge legibility issues in terms of, for some people, just having the confidence of having a human representative is an interest, right? So for the accountability that you mentioned is an interest. And so you do see that there are these real challenges in translating what seem like really aligned legal concepts into the operation of the architecture of the relationships that underpin them. And one of the real challenges with certified professions is that of course, as users, a lot of what we experience is advice. But as givers or as service providers, there's a tremendous set of professional responsibilities and duties like loyalty to ensure that you're not doing things like gambling with, person, with people's assets or taking unreasonable risks with their health because it advances your interests, your research interests, for example. And so where I think that we're seeing a lot of this kind of come up in access to justice really is about how do you model the integrity of the underlying relationship as an integral part of the service alongside just what the substance of the output of the service looks like. Right. right. Emphasizing that the relationship remains really critical despite you know, whatever technology is there. Great. Sandy, reaction to the sort of professionalization of that question? Yeah, I mean, um, I'm very human-centered AI. Mm -hmm. We've done things like uh, 
build legal experts to help lawyers uh, process claims by indigent people faster, better, et cetera. But there's a human there. This is a tool to increase it. Um, the way I think of trust uh, comes from an experiment where we, we actually looked at the behavior of a whole community for 18 months. And we noticed that people who went to each other, so reciprocally, you came to me, I came to you. If you looked at those sorts of relationships, uh, as sort of the frequency of those, you could predict people's answers to trust questions. Trust questions are like, would you loan this person 100 bucks? Right. Would you let this person watch your child? Mm -hmm. Would you loan them your car? Right? And you, you could do an enormously good job, like 95% accuracy, at predicting the answers to those questions by the, by the reci reciprocity of the interaction, which I interpret that people believe that the other person was providing some valuable service, question, entertainment, God knows, uh, and that that was a reciprocal. Uh, thing, and I would take that as being the you know evolutionary basis of trust, mm -hmm. and so a lot of our mechanisms are sort of like that. It's like okay, if if you do this to a long bunch of people and they come back, and that happens over a long time, then you're a trusted authority, right? Or you're a trusted service or something like that. And then the difficulty is not over the long term. Because we can, I mean, if, if we have this relationship for 50 years and I continue to like it, and you, it's probably good. The, the question is, is, I don't know you. We come together. You do something. Are, is it going to work this time? And trying to predict that, we invent all these devices, you know, punishments, et cetera, to do. But I like to start from this almost sort of evolutionary yeah. background. Uh, and I like to describe it as, are you pretty sure that this person has your back? Right, right. So when something goes weird, are they going to be on your side? Right. And that, you know. Yeah, I love that way of thinking. I think of trust in, the, in a very similar way, especially how it would have evolved for us. And, you know, in some ways, institutions were a response to, like, well, I can't have reciprocal relationships with everybody anymore, so we right. have to build. Okay. So these institutions are in place. Now we could argue, a lot of people said, Harvard Business Review, even a couple of years ago, we're in a trust crisis. And, and yet, we have all these amazing technologies. You see the rise of the sharing economy, where people are you know, putting their money where their mouth is trust-wise, letting people stay at their homes, et cetera. I'll start with you, Sandy, since we ended with you there. How, how do you see the next wave of the technologies we're considering here, decentralized you know, technology? How do you see it playing a role in this trust crisis? Some would argue, I, I disagree a little bit, that you know, the open web, you know, social media have un played a role in undermining trust. How does the next? Next well, era change. To go back to the sort of evolutionary thing, the way we transferred trust, right, is if you and I have a trusted relationship, and I have a trusted relationship with him, and I recommend to you that he's a good guy, um, it's probably we have the same criteria enough that that'll sort of work. Plus, he's not going to screw you over because then I'll be mad at him. Okay, so it's this sort of network based. It's trust. a network embedding, mm -hmm. and uh, within a particular context, because it's only a context, right? Uh, we share the same utility, same judgment, and then in those cases, the recommendation works. Mm -hmm. And so it's that type of thing. It's like we were talking about identity here mm -hmm. earlier. So I think identity is fundamentally a community process, mm -hmm. it's something where people are willing to say, yeah, he's a good guy. Yes, he's who he says he is. <laughs> it's those sorts of things. And that network embedding thing is the thing that, that makes you trust it. Both the positive, like it's likely to be the same utility function, and the negative of if they screw you, there's real payment problem, there's real pain for them. Right. Sean? I, just, I think one of the things that's so interesting about this is we rebuild, so we talk a lot about centralization and decentralization. And I think in reality, most of the time, what we're talking about is devolution. And we like, we, devolution is this idea that there are sort of like a, like a Russian doll style series of authorities where we delegate levels of accountability and sort of freedom to act at progressive levels, right? And usually it's local, it's hyper specific, uh, 
And then the further you go, the more general the rule, but the more broadly it applies. And even in your description of how we might apply a three-person trust, like mm -hmm. in a relationship, you know, my, the, in order for that to work, my belief has to be that you have enough authority, if not just, if not mm -hmm. just sort of, that you have enough authority over your friends so that they mess my thing up, I can come to you and you can seek some form of justice as a result right. of that. And so it, it may differ quite a bit by essentially context, but we are talking about creating these orders and identifying these very flexible orders. The example that you gave earlier, the people for whom I would lend $100 versus my child, I love both of them, but they're not the same group of people hmm. very often, right? Yeah. What I expect in someone who's gonna care for a child is very different than a credit rating. And so those two things I think, like you say, are related and they can be correlated indicators and they very often show up in aggregated analyses as very effective. But I think a lot of times what we're talking about in practice is how do you articulate the specificities of what those relationships look like in power of administration because it might turn out that you and I find, for example, that we have different criteria for what success looks like, and we just didn't talk about it, which also happens a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so just to clarify, so yeah. the community in which we did this, 100 bucks was a lot of money. Mm -hmm. I, now, I, I, you, you can imagine like a different community, like say Palo Alto, where 100 bucks, that's what I spent. Well, I actually don't, I, it's funny because I don't think the 100 bucks matters. I, the, I, I worked for 10 years at Frontline SMS, so the, funnily, the, <laughs> I think the bio's a little out of date, but the Frontline SMS worked entirely in places where $100 was a huge amount of money, and mm -hmm. savings collectives were extremely common. And they were common to the scale where they would even provide things like down payments on farming equipment or homes. Like Those kinds of arrangements exist because of their belief in what their kind of network mm. influence and governance over mm -hmm. each other could look like. Mm -hmm. mm. Does it, you, you started thinking about crypto and, and the potential for it to create like, you know, to create trust right back in the 90s. Right. What are some of the things, I mean, you were an early thinker on this. What are some of the conclusions you, you sort of walked away with? You know, I think those early conclusions may be ripe again now with this wave of Web3 and uh, the reinvigoration of ways to configure cryptography fundamentally mm -hmm. um, to transform our relationships and and capabilities. So in the 90s, hey Ruben, um, in the 90s, uh, we were very interested in how public key crypto systems could be used to um, make the most of the web and enable things like e-commerce. Um, something that was necessary was um, a way to signal trustworthiness um, and to even have confidence that the counterparty was who they claimed to be. Right. Um, and some other basic things like what is a contract, what is a signature, oh, which always used to be pen and paper. And, uh, and so there was, a, there was one school of thought which I was an early adopter of that, um, that cryptography is so powerful, you know, it's mathematically infeasible that it, you know, that it didn't come from the originator or that it was changed in transit or other things. We sort of over, we had, uh, we had confidence that it could be a source of trust. Mm -hmm. And there was this whole uh, wave for a business model of a trusted third party, which is a certification authority. And they would sort of vet people, get their public key embedded in an X509 certificate, and then you'd really know who they were because the math all works. What I came to realize was that in trying to roll this stuff out in lots of different contexts and government and the private sector, um, is it didn't really work that way. Um, you know, uh, and that tr ultimately, the right way to look at it, I think, is that um, trust doesn't follow cryptography. It's better to have cryptography follow trust. Hmm. So maybe um, I already trust a brand or a community. Um, being a what I can now do with crypto systems can really extend and expand um, how we can start to automate those things and scale them. But the the source of trust, the vectors of trust, mm -hmm. I think fundamentally are human mm -hmm. emanations, mm -hmm. and uh, it's right to put the human in the middle of questions of trust. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, that's really interesting because you know, there's so much discussion about this topic of like, well, the tech will take care of the trust part, and and I, I often worry that the relationship, that you know, kind of what Sandy's were mentioning, um, gets dropped. Yeah. So that's really, I'm glad you, you you came to that conclusion. Very interesting to see what happens here.
Um, Sean, to, to, to shift a little bit about but keeping the human centered, uh, um, you think a lot about participation. And when I was reading some of your work, I was really struck by like, even though you're thinking a lot about governance, you're really thinking about people. So why do you focus so much on participation when you're thinking about these new governance type models? Uh, <clears throat> I, it's a really great question. I think that fundamentally, a lot of what we're designing for agency, mm -hmm. eight models of agency, models mm -hmm. of self-determination, models of collective determination, and those are all messy and they always have been, but the participation gaps significantly affect the legitimacy of whatever comes out. And I think a lot of what we're talking about, particularly when we're, you know, a lot of, particularly when we're talking about governance or protocol level things, that the lived experience, to Daz's point, you know, access to justice is a huge operational issue. The, the less than like 70% of the world has anything we're modeling meaningful access to justice. So how we enforce these rules and how we participate in the enforcement of those rules is not only, it is important, extremely, extremely important from an equity lens and an inclusion lens and getting, building a good system before it goes out the door, but it is never, a, it's never done on deployment day, right? And anyone who's ever deployed a technology knows your job has just started on the day of deployment. And what most of us aren't building in digital systems are ways that ongoing participation intentionally in, politi in a politically aware sense affects the maintenance and evolution of a digital or a data-defined system. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's so fascinating about, about law as a kind of model of, of adaptation is that law, is, law takes a rule and directionally interprets it, right? It's too broad to be useful when it's first done, and courts then say, in this circumstance it applies, in this circumstance it doesn't. And the rule changes as a result mm -hmm. of that adjudication. If you take the direction of like machine learning often, or AI systems, which adopt an, ob an objective function, and then essentially terraform the reality that they analyze in the image of that objective function, that's a directionally opposed approach to logic and rule application. That's not to say that there's not value and role for both of them. It's just to say that we're not going to be able to say this law works for everything, as law will tell, as no lawyer, every lawyer will tell you that's not how it works, and for AI and for sort of computational automation technologies. But the the barometer that we'll have for how well they work is how well they adapt to the needs of the community and the use cases in which they're deployed, and that is most effectively accomplished through diverse and effective participation. Yeah. Sandy, I see you nodding along. So um, I buy this. I, I will put it in a slightly I'll different frame. No, no, I'm not <laughs> going to buy it like that. Either. So, so um, I talked about uh, reciprocal relationships and trust. And of course, a community is something like a densely connected set of those things. Communities change over time. So the people who are in some bubble, and this has to do with a specific area, right? So you may be in a different bubble in another part of your life. That's the group of people with which you have general trust, this sort of implied trust. It's the basis for doing collective action. So in some sense, that's the functional part of human societies, these clusters of trust relationships. And I think that that's the thing that needs to be this adaptation you're talking about. It's like, what do the people that you're part of your community think, need, trust, and that should define uh, what it is that ends up happening. The, the, the sort of general way we've talked about this in other literatures is social capital. So, you know, uh, there's right. you know, bridging and bonding, this sort of bonding capital. And if I had to analyze what's wrong with like social media, is you build the relationship with the media platform, not with your community. Right. Mm -hmm. It really ought to be something where this is a discussion with your community to reach some sort of, um, not necessarily uniform consensus, but some sort of sense where you trust each other are good actors and can act. And, and that's got to, that's the evolutionary, that's the part that counts. That's, right. are you going to thrive or not? But I mean, isn't the, the hard part is in the middle, right? And I think Sheila said this earlier about Mastodon, which is fascinating, right? You have 
local communities of self-governance, right? Exactly the kind of model that you're describing. And admittedly, you know, it's early days. But like the idea is that they're aligned by some set of ideas about how the community should be run. But Mastodon is then this overarching sharing network. It's the realization that we can't live in just our community sure. and that our shared dependence then requires us to deal with conflict of decisions. Your validly arrived at community choice may be different than mine. Right? And, and we have to figure out what are the things that are important about our association that we can agree on and that we can operate forward with. Yeah. One of the things that's subtle that you see particularly in Silicon Valley is the use of the word community. <laughs> community is everybody who <laughs> logged into this mailing list. Or nobody's like, oh, no, come on. You know? um, I like to focus on the physical community because you know, we suffer the same earthquakes, we use the same police, same hospital, our kids go to the same school. We have a lot of things we care about in common. And very few things you would do affect only one part of your life. Right? So if you, if you have a common utility functions and you can reach some sort of consensus, then that's more likely to be something that I think that, that stays effective. But but it has to cover more than just one issue. The, I, I, I so agree, and I think that, you know, I think a lot about sort of James Scott's uh, imagined communities. So I should be, be honest, I'm sorry, I'm a lawyer. Uh, the way I think about a lot of these things is sort of through the lens of law, but imagine communities is essentially this idea that communities exist out of aligned or shared interests, in the same way that you're talking about yeah. geography as a good proxy. And geography is a good proxy, and we use it a lot. Um, it is also really flawed, even in some of the examples that you were describing. Like, we all care about having a high quality hospital. But when it comes to admission, particularly during, rates, you know, during times of pandemic, when hospitals fill up, our interests become competitive. And so we have different mechanisms to sort of deal with how we participate in ensuring the quality of our healthcare versus how we deal with the competitive nature of accessing service provision. And I think having governance mechanisms that are able to, to walk on both sides of that line in the same way sure. is sure. absolutely critical. And what, it, what that, I think, leads us to do is to, exactly as you started by saying, interrogate ambiguities like public interest, like social benefit, like community-driven or community-governed. And when you start to articulate what interests do I specifically mean, what application is this data actually going into, what are the alignment of incentives and interests that should go into governing this? And maybe instead of one trust, we need two that you know, make, make different arguments about why their interests should be met differently. And I think that, to me, that, it's that how you do the lattice work in between and how you create permanence or tempor temporal infrastructure, temporary infrastructure, to address those, those shifts over time is so much of the design challenge of what we're describing. <laughs> Does it, you think a lot about how, like, the, how the legal structures, how the rule of law can evolve. Do you have any thoughts on you know, what Sean's getting out here? Like, hey, we need to rethink how this is going to work in our communities. How can you know, this sort of slow-moving legal system evolve to fit some of what Sean and, and Sandy are talking about? Oh, any thoughts? Uh, one or two. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the first thing I was thinking uh, in the, when I was kind of popcorning this awesome dialogue was with Mastodon, which is an interesting example because in theory it is a kind of a envelope around a, a bounded community, if you will, or set of people, and it's decentralized and that there are some overarching uh, connections across the network. Um, I would say that it got, like if we looked at like the seven layer stack of the network, it got like some of this right in in a, some parts of it, but one of the main things that's missing to what you were extolling in terms of the what we want from community is the decision making around it. So if you look at it, it's more like a bunch of warlords, if I had to do a political analysis, that say, these are my rules, this is my server, and then everybody else can kind of come like, and, and, they, and then how the rules are applied or adjudicated is, you know, we go back to what we hope is a benevolent leader. What if instead <laughs> um, there, there we added a another layer in the stack of a protocol where um, when you spin up a server, it could be a community-based server, or you have another name for it, and then the, the several things that we sort of decide on, the acceptable use policy, the onboarding, the offboarding, you know, a few key things are the result of people signing up, 
talk, talk, debating it, you know, coming up with a consensus, and now they've shown they can have consensus, and then they have consensus around how we shall behave. And then they can communicate, and guess what? They can repeat that and have consensus around how shall we act? What will we do? Um, that would be an interesting approach mm -hmm. to this. I was telling Sandy earlier, we'd both lived in Lexington for a while. I was in a town meeting. I don't know how many people are familiar with New England town meetings, but it's basically close to a direct democracy. Mm -hmm. If you're registered to vote and you live within a municipality, you can show up once a year for a few days and in you know, like the gymnasium or the city hall, the town hall, and you basically vote on like the police budget, the school budget, you know, the whatever, the, ta the local tax rate, like real stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and, the, and it was, uh, I really cut my, I thought I understood parliamentary procedure, but I didn't know the, you know, it, it was friendly, we all knew each other, but it was, it was like really deep politics in some ways, and, we, and it forces consensus, okay. you know, and then anybody that could vote could also, was also eligible to propose something, and if it had a, enough of a, um, you know, enough seconds, it could go on the, on the ballot, and then we'd all debate it. I, th I think we have a lot of models. I think that the gap now is to start to apply models mm -hmm. for participation that's meaningful, including governance and operations in an ongoing way to these, to these online fora. Mm -hmm. Well, this notion of consensus, I think, is an important one. And, and, and to do it, you need a sense of agency, which requires a sense of like knowledge and, and efficacy. Okay, So this might be unfair as a psychologist going at you guys, but here's one worry I have. Uh, I'm a pretty educated guy and, and some of the things you're all talking about, I have to work really hard to understand, right? And certainly with, with some of the new technologies coming online. So in psychology, we talk about folk theories, which are essentially this idea of like how I think something works. So you say, here's what an NFT is, and I have a folk theory. To, to, to come to consensus, to be able to even have some of the conversations you all are talking about, people will need pretty serious you know, understandings of what these are. One thing we haven't talked about is what a lay person, and, and, and by when I say lay or folk, this is in no way like insulting. I just mean they're not scientifically or rigorously examined. How do you, the three of you, think, and maybe we'll start um, with you, Dawson. How, how, do you, how do we think about getting people to be able to think about consensus when they have to understand what are fairly complex technologies that perhaps even most people in this room don't fully understand? Mm. Yeah, that's really the question of the day. Um, I mean, I mean, one. Th I mean, you know, I always go back to education. If you look at even the curricula in in schools, there's a, a bit of a gap. It hasn't caught up. If you look at the curriculum in law school, even I mean, I don't know if I'd call that like lay people. We're supposed to be experts. There's a huge gap. Right. Like they couldn't look at a packet or figure out the provenance of an email from the headers or almost anything, it, like basic stuff even. It's not, I mean, some people can, but it's not part of the curriculum right. or the expectations for proficiency in technology. Mm -hmm. So I'd say education's a really key thing. Yeah. Beyond that, I think there's some methods and mechanisms for engagement that can temper the need for everyone to be an expert, which is not a reasonable need. Um, and I mean, people do need to be conversant. Um, but like citizen assemblies, for example, where you get like a random cross-section of people and you have some um, kind of envelope of process for them to look at key, like governments do that for key public policy questions, um, and then to basically come to a consensus on what the recommendations are and have that feedback into the process. The people do this with budgeting as well here in the Bay Area. Um, if, when that's facilitated well and when you, you have the right briefing books and people can be educated in that context, that can be another way to do it, unless of like a, everyone has to, you know, the school system needs some kind of standard. Um, you know, at the end of the day, um, I, you know, I, I think that's a question that we need to ask as a society right. and come up with better answers to. Yeah, I, I really like to the, the points you make there, which is we do have experts and we rely on them. Like we do this exercise in my classes where we ask everybody, um, do you know how a toilet works? And, Everybody will raise their hand and they'll say, okay, everybody draw how a toilet works. And only about 5% know how a toilet works, right? And it's like, well, that's okay because you, you just do what you need to do. And if it stops working, you call a plumber, right? And so we, I, I agree with you that there's like, we will be, it, when we can trust certain expertise, we can then buy. But to be conversant, I think it's important. Do you have thoughts on this, Sean, in terms of like, what do people need to know in order to be able to be participants in this new AI economy? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm really torn because on the one hand, um, I'm doing some work, um, the organization I work for is doing some work to build participatory governance and particularly digital transformation focused participatory governance into professional schools. I think a lot of the conversation has been like, oh, how do we develop an ethics of technology and then bring it to a professional context? And I think how most of it works is actually like someone who has maybe no exposure to this conversation whatsoever is like, I have two vendors, I need to pick one, and my, cat my, <laughs> my analysis framework, my diligence may not have anything to do with any of these issues. And so on the one hand, I really do believe that education is a critical part of this and that we should be looking at it as moving from the problem to the technology as opposed to from the sort of technology to the problem. And I think that that's also sort of the second, the part of it that's com complex for me is that I think any time a field says, oh, someone else just doesn't understand us, like that's, a, that's, that's two sides of that, right? I would, if having been through law school, Daz is absolutely right. It does not prepare you to become a sort of digitally aware advocate. And I would also say that technology providers live in a world of law that has been largely ignored, if not, you know, most like very broadly exploited in interesting and creative ways. But, you know, there's no like CS curriculum that's like this is what false advertising looks like in the way that you architect a privacy promise or a security promise versus what you deliver beyond like a certification mechanism, right? And so th both of those things are true, right? We need more, more translation across disciplines to acknowledge the influence that both infrastructures have and are projecting into the world. And I think that, you know, when you, that sounds highfalutin, so to speak, but when you take it out of generality and you put a data governance question in front of someone, do you want your crisis text hotline provider to reuse your data in some way? I don't know what the answer to that question is, but the person probably knows at a gut level. And I think that there is, we very often in our perceptions of people and the way that we describe them in participation systems, conflate education and powerlessness. And I say a lot at work, like don't bring education to an incentives fight. And I think you know, when you're talking about what does it mean to be a participant in a digital economy, you know, people are smart enough to know when they're powerless. And having a strong opinion about something you're powerless about is great Thanksgiving meal fodder, but absolutely no way to run a governance system. Right. Yeah. Here, here. Great. So I have a, a sort of, I buy what you're saying. But I think there's a bigger picture, which is we're not that smart. The human race, as far as I know, uh, in the last couple of millennia, only invented one thing that helps us make decisions, and that's called the scientific method. Mm -hmm. okay? And it's not what you're taught in school, where the, the brainy guy sits in the corner and cooks something up deductively. It's trial and error. Mm -hmm. You know, you take basic physics. It's not sort of generally understood, but that has been sort of reinvented as being the same because the bridges kept falling down. And they said, well, gosh, you know, Newton was really smart, but maybe it wasn't quite right because the bridge fell down, right? Uh, and I see this across every discipline that I'm a part of. I mean, dark energy, right? Where was dark energy 20 years ago or dark matter? Well, it was nowhere. <laughs> And yet, what, it's 80% of the universe? It's like, oh, and now the most recent one saying, oh, well, actually, it was a mistake, right? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> like, so, so I think what you have to do, the story there, is that you have to experiment, and you have to measure what happened. And then you have to propagate that to people so that they can make up their own experiments, OK? What does that look like in terms of governance? Well, you know, the. The idea is that you have separate places that have fairly shared utility, and they make up their own rules, and they share what they're doing with other people. And then you look over a couple of years later, and you say, how's that working out, right? And so, so one of the more inspiring things, I learned this from, from Daza, is the, it's called the uniform code. Mm. Right? So states make up their rules about, and particularly about commerce, right? Mm. And they do it independently. But then every once in a while, a bunch of you guys get together someplace. Uh, and say, hey, here's an idea, and other people say, well, and then they talk about it, and they come up with some recommendations, like, hey, that sounds pretty good. And then other states look at it, and yeah, they do it, right? 
And the thing that's interesting about it, so that's a collective intelligence, a learning network, trial and error. And what's interesting about it is it's been sort of successful for our economy for what, more than a century now. So we went from, you know, Pony Express, you know, gold standard, you know, World War II, the Depression. They just kept modifying it, right? And it actually has worked pretty well. I mean, it's got problems, but, you know, um, I, I think we're not that smart that we know what the answers are. I think we have to keep, we have to keep trying things, figuring out whether it worked, sharing that, and then trying new things. Can I do a follow-up yeah. on that? Yeah. Um, so uh, for th how many people here have heard of the Uniform Commercial Code, UCC? Okay, so just to fill in a little gap there, there's something called the Uniform Commercial Code in the United States, and one of the things that's really interesting about it is even before it gets, it, it, that's uniform law that all the states pass, so we have the same rules across state boundaries um, within a, something that's a state jurisdiction, like contracts or state jurisdiction, for example. Um, a lot of commerce is, is regulated at the state level. Um, bef with this body, the Uniform Law Commission, before they even will propose to have a drafting committee for a uniform law, they, go, they let something go for years and years to sort of see how is this working in practice. And the, part of the reason why the US Uniform uh, commercial code is, is really, really powerful and really effective is because it supports and reflects actual practice and then they craft the rules to sort of fill those gaps that are actually needed as opposed to trying to think up what might be needed in a perfect logical system later. And then you mentioned common law. So then after it's enacted, it's continuously kind of battle tested and you get all these data points. So it's interpreted in a way that again supports and reflects how the law should be applied in practice and it evolves. This is basically the essence of what we're doing at law.mit.edu where we're attempting to apply some of Sandy's um, thinking in computational social science to what we call computational law. Hmm. And if you go to law.mit.edu, you'll see some very interesting um, approaches to algorithmic law that can adapt over time. Mm -hmm. And in the next couple of days, we'll drop the next release called Composable Governance, which gets at some of the things Josh was talking about, Josh has published in that, and, uh, and uh, some of the things I was starting to talk about, about how do we, how do we architect the governance in a way that um, can create the environment we want to inhabit? Yeah. Great, great. See, but that's, to me, that's like, that's the scientific method. Yeah. We try a bunch of stuff and see how it worked, and then we try to get better. So, <laughs> and, but the other, the other problem here is that this is all pre-lab, or this is all in the lab, right? And I think that one of the things that we sort of, that in your description sort of flew under the radar yeah. is that like every state ratifies it. Essentially, yeah. and that's like that's a real governance process. Yeah. Like one of the things that so a, a interesting adjacent example for this is that the EU has issued standard contractual clauses for data protection. The standard contractual clauses are a recognition that it is essentially illegal to transfer personally identifying information, which there are enough computer science people here to know is a lot internationally. Which is to say that most of the internet is operating illegally most of the time right now. Right. And, <laughs> And if you're a lawyer who has to write contracts in this environment, what you're trying to say is there is an intractable amount of practice that does not coincide with the legal foundations that, currently, that are currently articulated, but we are good faith professionals who are not going to let large systems collapse by virtue of the fact that this legal infrastructure doesn't exist. So the standard contractual clauses are, okay, okay, we know that the international treaty infrastructure isn't there, yeah. but... If you use and implement these contractual clauses in actual practice, learning from actual practice, in the way, same way you're describing, you know, you're gonna reduce compliance risk. This is the direction we are going. This is the guidance meant to cover this gap, right? But there's a big, big international governance difference between one trading block setting up a set of, a set of contractual clauses that are meant to become the private law infrastructure of the way data economies work for a while and a global process of adopting or agreeing what, what those contractual clauses, clauses might look like. And I think that that is in particularly important for the idea of professional governance in these various spaces. And it may be that there are data-wide rules, but to your you know, experiment in, in 
computational law, there are obviously also a huge, there obviously is also a huge role for domain specific rules and domain specific governance of those rules. And I think of, you know, how we integrate the process of ratification and adaptation with you know, administration is a lot of what we're not seeing get addressed in data governance design conversations. But that's why I like the uniform code, because that's actually out in the world. Let me tell a really quick story. So, so I ran a discussion for the Club de Madrid, which is like all these former prime ministers and all the senior EU regulators. And I said, look, we don't really know enough about how to regulate AI. I mean, we can make up our minds and stuff, but that's not maybe the way the world works and it goes really fast. What we need to do is have an audit trail and direct and specific liability so that if you see something, you can find out if it really was liable and you know how to nail the guy. All the prime ministers and presidents loved the idea. All the regulators hated the idea. I got, I got called Anglo-Saxon, which <laughs> I was, I think, proud of. <laughs> but, but, but it's this idea, this, this tension between we know what to do and, well, we don't really know what we do. Let's collect a lot of evidence, figure it out, make sure nothing really bad happens. And as we begin to learn more, we sort of adapt the rules to it. Right? Yeah. I think from a governance perspective, what happens in technology a lot is that the conditions are a lot more different than we give them credit for. And so you have mm. a set of, you have something that is legitimately arrived at via the scientific method in a defined circumstance that then says, correct, it was effective, we got exactly what we wanted out of this, it is ready to be at global scale in the world. And it will then move out and be applied or deployed at the scale of technology or at the scale of global deployment without the mechanisms for communities that are then affected to contextualize, to hold, to But to isn't that the UCC, isn't that exactly the UCC? No. Method? Maybe I misunderstand. Yeah, the UCC is a set of codes that is, def, that is essentially, for example, the UCC, I believe, sets out that the maximum available size of a verbal contract is $75,000. So I can agree to pay you $76,000 in passing, no enforceability. Don't, okay. let's, let's not do that in real life. I'm just Statue not paying cost. Sandy $76,000. Oh. But I know, right? What a panel. Um, but the idea is that the, the uniform code sets the idea for what is reasonable. So it sets the default presumption. Mm -hmm. Now. If you are arguing a case before a court and you say, we both knew and agreed that $75,000 was not appropriate to our conversation and therefore that standard didn't apply or, or wasn't relevant to us, a court might interpret that a little bit differently than just going from the standard. But like most professional standards of practice, absent some very dis, you know, specific mm -hmm. attention, mm -hmm. that's what's going to be the default. Yeah. And that's why professional governance infrastructure in the space is so important. But it is, and, and it becomes guiding because the cost of trying to deal with the exceptions is high. But, but so there's this uniform code, but then states modify it. Right. Right? So like some states say, well, you have to have this label on your thing, or you have to have that sort of thing. So it's not uniform. Well, exactly. Right? I mean, the yeah. core, they said, well, yeah, we all tried this. It seems to be good. But then everybody specializes mm -hmm. for their own community. And sometimes they do it wrong. Well, right. and I think we also norm like we, we tend to think of rights as like, yeah, no, I know, I, I'll, okay. I promise to stop. Uh, I'm finding it interesting, so hopefully too. you are too. We think of rights as the kind of thing like, I have the right to do X, and therefore it is inalienable, right? But in, so I of course, think that's a mistake. Of course it's, yeah, it is 100% a mistake. Our rights are the product of enforcement architectures that agree and are yeah. willing to deploy their resources in their enforcement for whatever yeah, reason. Yeah. And I think that that tension between, one of the things that has happened a lot is that rule and norm development in digital spaces has fallen prey to the comparative political economy of the institutions that might enforce them. So one country might say, just because you have chosen X type of rule, and I don't wanna do things the way that you do because I want an independent market for something different in my space, I'm gonna do it this way. Or you might find, as happens, for example, with the standard contractual clauses, as happened with GDPR, there are a lot of economies that are not in any way you know, set up to enforce GDPR who adopted it in order to remain aligned with EU, with the EU as a trading partner. Right. Mm -hmm. so but don't might, enforce it. Might provide <laughs> right. Some, uh... right, but don't enforce it in any way. So here's some 
kind of play-by-play -play and color commentary. <laughs> yeah. on, um, so <laughs> one, one thing is, is the way in which I feel that your kind of sense of the UCC is, well, I'll just, I'll just add a, a little color to it. I, I'm um, not a lawyer. Oh, yeah. I, so I, this is a perfect time to get a little I'm deeper. I'm just from you guys, right? <laughs> um, so one I thing about it important. is uh, the, un the word uniform, and that is critical in terms of having a core, and that's the point of it. Um, the ways in which it can be further adapted are really interesting too, and that gets to this tension between um, having things that can be customized uh, in context. One of them is what, what you said, which is um, when, when it's proposed to states for ratification or for adoption, you know, you will sometimes get certain amendments um, that are really appropriate for how they want to run their economy. And there's tension there, but ultimately that helps make it work, um, right. like the U.S. is, and, and then over time, especially for commercial matters, states that are doing things that aren't working or creating too much of a barrier suffer, and there's pressure to, to reform that over time, so there's something that, that does work and doesn't make business flee. The other way is uh, when you've got the rule, as you were saying earlier, it's, it's a general rule, but how does it apply in the context of these specific facts and circumstances and this kind of unique fact pattern? And we get into dispute resolution and things like that. And, um, and then the case law defines like, I don't know, a huge amount of the volumes of what people will read when they understand what the uniform law is. The other thing is that most of the law that you're starting to get up, and I'll just put words to it so everyone can understand, it's called gap filler law, okay? So that um, if we want to have a contract, we could have like a one-page contract that gets the essential terms, like I'll do this for this amount of money by this time, that's perfectly good. What about all these other sort of edge cases, and like who's liable if, this, if something happens and it's delayed by three days and whatever else? We don't have to hire lawyers and have a 50-page agreement because the Uniform Commercial Code provides gap-filling default provisions when the parties don't agree on all the details. The final thing I'll say, which partly why I love the Uniform Commercial Code, is that, as you were getting at, if the parties disagree with like the, the outcome of this or that gap-filling provision isn't what they want to happen, um, then they can explicitly in their contract um, write something different, and then that's the applicable law. So the gap fillers fill gaps. They don't contradict what the will of the parties are for the most part. So just, anyway, there's layers of, of um, I would call it so, legal so the, primitives. The, the, the top point is yeah. this sounds like a community reaching consensus yeah. Yeah. and continually innovating as circumstances change and leaving a little bit of freedom for the members of the community yeah. because everybody's a little different. Yeah. And I, I, I like that as a sort of abstract model mm -hmm. of what we need to do much more generally. Mm -hmm. as opposed to uniform laws that yeah. come from someplace and God yeah. told them and they're Yeah, determined. and that's really the point of, the, of that commentary is that there's a lot of things, that, there are what I would call almost like governance and legal primitives or design patterns that we already have. And now the quite, I think the really fun part now is how can they be reconfigured and um, composed and applied f to get to the next phase that we want to get at? Lego law. Lego law. Lego law. I like it. <laughs> T trademark right here. Okay, I want to make sure that we save time for uh, people's questions. So uh, there's microphones on uh, either side. So if you have a question you want to ask uh, anyone, uh, go ahead and, and send up there. And while people are thinking about their questions, um, I, I'm, I'm gonna, I want to squeeze one thing in it that, that none of you have thought about and we haven't done any prep on. Uh, as a Canadian, I'm an optimist. It's sort of a part of our system of thinking. And so what I, I'm curious about, uh, amongst a lot of the doom and gloom that is, is coming out, and, and, and we're seeing a lot of regulatory problems with you know, current systems and, and ongoing bankruptcies, what is something that you're optimistic about, that you're really excited about in, this, in, in a new sort of data and AI ecology um, that, that you could you know, even be an advocate, perhaps? So Daz, we'll start with you, and we'll work our way across. What an awesome. Um, palate cleansing question. <laughs> um, and so uh, the, the main thing for me right now, and it's, it's no question about what the answer is for me, it's um, I've been working with consumer reports a great deal. Mm -hmm. um, and you, if you were here at the first panel, um, you will have heard uh, the announcement that we have a new app called Permission Slip. Hmm. Um, and if you didn't hear, well, we have a new app called Permission <laughs> Slip. It's in the Apple Store, just launched yesterday or the day before. And what it allows, what it enables is um, for any consumer, any of us, 
to exercise the rights that we already have with respect to our personal data. We have the, under California Consumer Privacy Act, we have the right to have data deleted. We can tell companies don't sell our data. We can get access to our data, so we can get our data from all these different places. Um, it's hard to do that in practice. You, these, all these idiosyncratic different ways right. that companies do it. So this app it has the role of a authorized agent, which is defined in the CCPA. Um, and this gets right back to trust. Consumers may choose that they trust consumer reports, which they can, mm -hmm. um, and and then the consumer they can delegate authority to them to go and exercise these rights with at the click of a button with any number of companies. Um, so that is huge. The thing I'm really excited about, though, is the part I'm working on is um, the next phase, which we call the data rights protocol. Mm -hmm. And the way we're doing that is we've circled up a bunch of, and you can find it at datarightsprotocol.org. And we've circled up a bunch of companies, consumer companies, authorized agents, a lot of other companies, privacy tech providers. And we're um, I'm basically facilitating a process where we have a consensus API that will be a common API and a, and a trust network. Um, that will allow these things to happen in less of a manual way mm. and at scale um, mm. much better. Yeah. So uh, I'm really excited about how we've done what I would consider legal engineering to encode these rights in a way that um, is enforceable under the law, people have to comply with, but is is more like the future than the past in terms of how we're implementing it. Right on. That sounds really cool. I've definitely taken notes. Awesome. Thank you. Sean, what are you, uh, what are you excited about? Uh, I have three things, and they're kind of adjacent. One is um, I'm really excited. We're starting a, a clinic at Arizona State University focused on how it is that we start modeling digital governance and participatory digital governance inside of regulated professions, inside of duty-holding professions. And I think, you know, talking about being human-centered, we literally need more people in, more, in, in, the, decision, in the positions making these decisions uh, with this kind of background and context and, and understanding and bearing. And so starting to model what that kind of learning through doing looks like is really exciting to me. Um, the second is we work with a, a group of activists uh, called the, the Light Collective. They basically, activism in this space has grown incredibly and, and in, in such heartening ways. The communities, I think, are leading the kind of, uh, you know, developing the descaling infrastructure that makes high-level protocols effective, right? The, the court infrastructure that makes national laws contextually available kind of thing. And so looking at building those, interse those intersections, I think, is extremely exciting. And, and seeing activists really take, you know, the Light Collective is also the ones who, in the Supreme Court, won the right to genomic privacy, which is like, you know, when you talk about using old-world governance to really shape digital governance, like that's... Uh, a master class. And then the last one is just, you know, for all of the very, very articulated flaws in public and regulatory models, it feels very clear to me that the trend is toward more specific, articulable uses, you know, more mapping of people's interests in the way that they participate in data and digital systems, and that there's an incredible even very often pro-market alignment around building participation into maintenance and evolution infrastructure so that you provide for long-term continuity and, mar and product market fit. So the, the confluence of those three things, systems designers, human pipeline, and kind of normative rules and expectations, all seem to be trending in the direction I think we want this to go, even though you know, progress is slow and slow. Yeah, right on. Great. <coughs> Sandy, uh, one last one before we go to our questions. Uh, I guess um, it's hard to know which one to sort of choose, I guess. There's a lot of things. That, well, that's good. Uh, yeah. Um, I think the thing that I see is I see communities, physical communities, uh, actually stepping up and trying to ask, well, what's happening to me by capturing their own data and debating it? So they're becoming evidence-based for advocacy, mm. for governance, local governance, things like that. And there's a number of uh, large players who provide data that are willing to support them. So for instance, in Canada, uh, it's called scale.ai, yeah. right? So part of that, try and help different communities really figure out what they should do using data that comes from their telco, their transportation, their bank, and mm. things like that. And in New England, um, 
some of the large banks have committed to providing data to community organizations to help them uh, manage themselves better. Okay. So that sort of, you know, empowering communities is, I think, one of the most important things you could do. Great, I don't fantastic. Know how it go, but, you know. Yeah, thank you. Thank all three of you. Great. Uh, let's start with uh, you over there, please. If you just, oh, is over on this side mm -hmm. first. Okay. Okay, I'm happy to thank you so much to the panel for a fascinating conversation. The uniform commercial code is a really interesting model, and I'm wondering if a uniform social media code would be a good idea, and if it, if it was, how would it be the same or different to the UCC? Uh, what would it, can you just extrapolate a little more on this title of a uniform social media code? Oh, like, I just what? came up with that. So you, you were talking <laughs> about the, univers, the universal, uniform commercial code, should there be a uniform form social media code? We were talking about Mastodon creating these small communities that are sort of, there are all sorts of issues sort of coming up, bubbling up around them. I'm curious if that, if that idea translate in the social media space and like if it did, like how would it be the same or different from the UCC? Interesting question. Can I try? Would you please? So, so along this theme of let's experiment and figure out what works, I mean, imagine that uh, social media platforms or groups had to actually pay attention to how their users were doing. So, you know, how many teenage girls are depressed in your media? How many people uh, take up arms and do something stupid or whatever? You know, and that you could have measurement of civic outcomes for people that use this. And, and then you can begin to relate that to policies of the platform and, and which are good policies and which are bad. Uh, that sounds a little sort of crazy, but you know, there's little factoids like if you got rid of anything that had more than about 5,000 followers, you'd get rid of almost all disinformation. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, oh, interesting. We did something. Uh, here at Stanford where we did this uh, strengthening democracy thing where basically uh, what Eric calls nut picking, you know, media tend to focus on like crazy guys, right? So if you had an information feed that sort of undid that, you could get people to be depolarized. Hmm. I mean, actually do it. <laughs> it's amazing. So there's two things that, co that's, that got me thinking. I'm so glad you went first, Andy. Uh, the two things that come to mind, so the, I'm a little bit constrained from, um, from knowing too much in some ways about the com uniform commercial code, so I'm thinking what's the jurisdiction of states and what's right. But even within that, um, I do think there's some, I think the two basic things that ought to be done and that would be appropriate for this type of uh, legal vehicle are number one, you know, property is one of those areas I was mentioning that's primarily governed at the state level, okay? Um, and that's real, real estate property, but also personal property. One type of personal property, I mean, our personal data is not just property. As we heard earlier, it also relates to human rights and other things, but one of the things it is is also property. It's something that's an intangible property, no problem. Um, having something that um, clarified ownership of property that happens to be digital and it's personal data by individuals would be really helpful, and that's been terribly skewed and obscured to oblivion by terms and conditions and, and evolution of social media today. Mm. And I think it would write many things. The second thing I'd say is the extent that these companies are incorporated in U.S. jurisdictions, um, you know, there's another, there's another touch point. And one thing that we used to um, have a stronger sense of is um, what it means to be a shareholder and, and how, that, how that relates to the governance of an organization. I could imagine some evolution of the corporate model of social media companies, um, which would enshrine an actual role for the people who are social in the social media um, by way of it, like a, some kind of like, um, like what we were talking about earlier, some kind of participation that matters in, in decision making, or at least some aspects of decision making about how to construct and operate and what the rules and priorities and, and unacceptable behaviors and other stuff would be for their own network. Um, and then finally, I'd just say something around portability. Um, so we'll never get everything right, and over-regulating things is almost worse than under-regulating them. Uh, but uh, 
so long as people have freedom to kind of take their social graph and all the stuff that's currently so deep, it, it, you can't get it out of Facebook and other blinks. If you could take your, not just your social data, but your social graph, your connections, the history of conversations, all the other social, all that other stuff, and and port it in an interoperable way to a different service, that would be incredibly potent. Um, so those are three things that I, I would put, I would nominate for the Uniform Law Commissioners to consider in their scoping committee for Uniform Law, and that would take like three years and be a bloodbath right <laughs> there. Sure. Yeah, I mean, it's funny, because I'm a, my, my, one of my law school specializations was international law. And so the idea of like how we're talking about the Uniform Commercial Code is adorable. Like it's lovely in the United States and if you're an American, but if you're someone using an American company's product in another country, it's a very different sort of set of circumstances. And it's also worth saying that the standardization is inside of a contract. So the Uniform Commercial Code is largely about what is appropriate in, in, the, in this defined aspect of negotiating a relationship. And I think one of the things I meant to say pretty much every time I spoke earlier is uh, what law, like law, trust to me is sort of the absence of enforcement authority. It's like I have to, it's rights I have but no exercise, no authority to exercise them independently. And so it's, it's an absence of power as opposed to the presence of it. And I think that in a lot of these instances, you know, the Uniform Commercial Code works in the United States because courts, commercial courts for lack, I mean, but work, you know, are an institutional infrastructure that works. If you're someone trying to scope a social media claim and then bring it against a company, no matter what high level rules you might think are sort of important and necessary to have, the architecture for how you do that is basically not, not existent. And actually with Sheila, who's here earlier, um, I helped lead something, uh, Pathways to Digital Justice, this was a, a WEF report that came out basically about this problem is that if you're from the user side, the, the problem is not that there are not enough rules, right? The problem is that there is no real accessible mechanism to enforce those rules. So when we talk about how you use data, right? Like if you use data to kill somebody, right? Presumably that is, I, you know, very exciting. But the, the idea is that that's, that's, that is like murder with a deadly weapon, right? Like we, we don't have an entirely parallel set of courts for the presence or use of a single weapon, we recognize that the use of instrumentation in service of an act that is otherwise illegal is at least illegal in and of itself, if not additively unlegal for the instrumentation use. And so when we're talking about how we engage with this, like yes, I think it's, it's very valuable to get to inter-community agreement about what norms should look like and power relationships should look like, but it is in my, in my held opinion, extremely more, like, like almost to the point of it not really being in the same conversation important, to be thinking about what are the architectures of accessing and enforcing those rights. And I'd even just end with saying, even the idea of rights enforcement as an aspiration is horribly unambitious, right? Like what we're, ta what we're talking about, what Daz is I think saying in terms of like wanting to be able to take and use what you're saying in terms of having communities be able to determine their own future with digital assets and the capacities that it provides. Like it's still, it's, it's still this idea that, that the agency of the community is gonna somehow rise up in the face of the absence of the instrumentation to do it, the institutional infrastructure to do it. So, so is this like, like I was talking about audit trails and, and understanding liability? So I, so I just wrote a, we just published a paper through ACM and presented it in South Korea this past summer, which is essentially about the difference between technology or protocol driven approaches to defining normative outcomes versus how you engage with the, the supply chain and the commercial incentive infrastructure that is likely to be between the lab and the market, and also how you deal with the, the functional access to justice problems, which are pervasive globally and you know, across subject matter. So it's, it's that yes, these are great ideas, we should continue to pile new normative expectations on the pin of a head that is our existing justice system, <laughs> or the head of a pin that is our existing justice system, but also we very, very desperately need more pins. Cool, thank you, great. Uh, question over there, please. Um, can, oh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, and challenge me if you have like a differing opinion, but I'm just gonna like ask the question the way I'm thinking about it. But it seems like, so Boston, the way I think about it is more mapped to like 
the future of regulation, whereas like Silicon Valley would be more mapped to like the future of disruption. So things that'll happen, like black swan events, that'll cause the need for new regulations. So for Kendall Square people, um, the data that they play with and that they become privy to may only available to them, say, through um, MIT or something like that versus like somebody playing with data around the Stanford Oval. Um, which do you guys think is more important to the future of governance in regard to uh, the data as capital aspect that these institutions harbor in Cambridge versus Palo Alto? Because obviously they're hulking forces in terms of that sort of framework of thought. But, you know, they have very different specialties, I think. Also, the cities that they exist within have different says in what the future looks like for, say, America or the world even. Anybody want to grab that? I don't feel like I really understand it in depth. Okay. Maybe well, the it was, basic maybe question is, can, can you say it in, for, for those of us who are memory challenged, perhaps in, in 15 yeah, basic, words or less? The basic question is, Palo Alto versus Cambridge, who do you think has more say in the future of governance in terms of modeling these things that you were all talking about? Uh, well, demonstrably, given that uh, was it almost all of the Supreme Court justices went through Yale, <laughs> right? So, and then the rest of them There's went to Harvard. Harvard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? So, so it's Yale and Harvard. <laughs> hmm. I mean, I, yeah, I yeah, 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 no. That's I, sort of a flip answer, but you yeah. know. Yeah. yeah. I think from my perspective, um, a lot of what happens when we talk about who will control or define the future is that we, we frame it around human capacity. And I think far more often, the things that we're talking about in terms of regulations and institutions, like the things that are valuable, the things that were hard won bits of progress were the protections that ensure some form of equity or some form of you know, fairness in the way that, that those capacities are then administered throughout society. I think the question that you're asking is essentially whether or not the institutions as they exist will remain relevant long enough to exert themselves over some, like a world that is just constantly disrupted by things. I might be wrong as I can tell by your gesture, but I, think, I don't think that I'm not gonna I, I'm not gonna answer by city, but I think that the one that is more important to preserve in line with the themes of this event is Cambridge. Mm -hmm. Change, but, but key. Yeah. No, thank you, really well, interesting. Can I say yeah, go ahead, Dustin, sorry. Um, so I love this question, especially the rephrasing of it, which I, I got better too. Um, and uh, I, I, I feel like I am sort of a Kendall Square person. <laughs> I've lived in Cambridge the last 13 years, a lot of the rest of my life. I'm actually from Oakland originally, and I've recently moved back and spent a lot of time around here. And um, usually when people talk about the sort of thing you're asking about, they say DC versus Silicon Valley. I like the way you phrased it, because if we assume certain decisions are happening in DC, it's like, who are they listening to more? Are they listening to like the angel on one shoulder or like the devil on the other? Whoever you want to say is holding yeah, this position. <laughs> um, um, or they, who are they listening to? Are they taking their cues from this kind of approach or that kind of approach? Ultimately, I, I've got to believe, you know, having walked the halls of Congress a lot and I've worked in a legislature before earlier in my career, I think w to do this well, we have to be able to have the judgment um, to know which approaches are well suited to, a, to the moment. And that it's I, one of the things that I think is great about America, I'm sorry to be so direct about that, but we have a, we, there's a diversity of approaches and capabilities and priorities here. And between them, we can adapt very successfully. What's needed is the judgment to know which to apply when or in what combinations. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Great, well, I love the question too in the end, and, and it's a great way to think about things, so thank you so much for asking it for us. And uh, we're at time, so uh, if you still have a question afterwards, let's um, reach out to the panelists afterwards. And uh, thank you all for your attention today, and thank the panelists for a really engaging conversation. As a, as a non-lawyer, I learned a ton here today, and I feel actually better than when I came, so that's always a good, a good sign. So thank you all very much, appreciate it.